Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 3, the prophet of hope, Zechariah. Father, we pray today and tonight that you would give us great insight in this whole situation with North Korea and uh, wanting to launch against the, us. And I pray that, God, that so many things are happening in our country and so many horrible feelings and so many shootings, unbelievable. And I pray that, God, that you would keep us safe tonight that you would put your angels around this place. Sometimes we forget to pray that prayer. And sometimes we forget to pray that you keep our children safe. And so, God, we ask that you keep our children safe, our wives and uh, husbands safe, that, God, you keep our single life safe, and that, God, that you would give us a heart and a passion. So, Lord, in these last days, I pray that, God, that you would begin to teach us, instruct us, and God, take away everything that's not pleasing to you and give us a song in our heart and a joy in our spirit that, God, you are the Lord of our lives and coming back to get us. So help us to occupy until that time. In Jesus' name, amen. You remember the second chapter of the prophecy here, the second chapter of Zechariah, really begins with the third part of this incredible vision. He had eight visions, Zechariah. In one night, and so kind of a bizarre thing. It's just unbelievable. And so we see him here, uh, one that was now going to measure. And he was on his way to Jerusalem to measure Jerusalem. And we mentioned a couple of interesting things about that. Number one, it could have been because he was now going to measure and compare them with his life. In other words, the Bible does say that we're not to compare ourselves, number ourselves, or measure ourselves with each other because we're unwise. And what it means is that either I'm going to be better than you or you're going to be better than I am. So one way I'm lifted up in pride, the other way I'm absolutely discouraged because I'm never going to get anywhere. Well, if I lift my life and put it next to God or Christ, then I'm always going to be humble. If you would do the same, we would have no problem with humility in this place. But the problem is, is that we don't do that. We compare ourselves, well, I'm so much better than so-and-so, I go to church, I don't miss any work, and so we become self-righteous. And that's the worst of all, because now I'm like the Pharisee, and I'm not like the publican who can barely make it. And so I get an attitude, and so that's dangerous. And so we mentioned to you that there really is a larger task at hand. The whole book has to deal with a spiritual life. In other words, yes, they're going to rebuild the temple. There's no doubt Ezra is going to do that. But what about rebuilding their lives? And yes, they're going to rebuild the walls like Nehemiah is going to do that. But what about rebuilding your family or rebuilding your children's life? Or maybe even rebuilding who you are by the Scriptures. And yes, they're going to begin to build their city and begin to move back in. But what about that life of Christ beginning to come alive and regenerate? And so we now hear the voice of God and as we learned Sunday morning that God desires us to be in fellowship. Not really a relationship as much as fellowship. Not so much of a communion as it is really uh, just not so much as unity, but communion, hanging out with Him. And so people have said, well, what's that mean, fellowship? It means sitting down with Christ. It means reading the Bible. It means applying the Word of God to your own heart, putting your name in there. For God so loved the world that you know, he, he loved Steve Mays and that he died for me. And when you do that, you begin to realize how special you are in Jesus Christ. And then about restoring a nation. And most of all, what we forget about is you have to remember that the glory of God disappeared. And it was a tragic day when the Spirit of God began to move out. And many of you probably have not read about this, but it talks about it. There, the Shekinah glory. You remember, that is that power of God and, and that glory that lit up everything and protected them by a cloud uh, there during the wilderness. And it was a Shekinah glory that was inside that tabernacle that hovered over them. But one day, God told them that if they didn't repent, he's going to remove his glory. And that was the very thing that Moses hung on to. I'm not going to take another step until I know that you go before me until I know that your glory is there. And so one day they woke up 
and they did not realize that the glory of God began to leave the Holy of Holies and creep out by the door. But the Bible says it stopped before it left the temple. And then it went underneath of the temple, and it went out the door and stopped. And it kind of looked around, and then it moved a little bit further outside, and then it came to the city and stopped. And then it came to the bottom of the hill and stopped. And then it went to the top of the mountain and stopped. What's it doing? It's wondering if anyone's going to stop it. Is anyone going to cry out, don't leave, come back? Is anyone going to run after it? And no one did. And it was gone. And it kind of reminds me of that story in the Old Testament where one day, you remember Elijah, he wanted the double blessing. And so he said, I'm not going to, Elijah, and Elijah, I'm not going to leave until I catch it. Well, he was able to see him take off in a chariot. He received the mantle and had the double blessing. And he did twice as many miracles. But check this out. Then he died. But no one behind him had the same heart. So though here was the guy, Elijah, and Elijah, and Elijah went after the mantle, and everyone knew he was chasing it. But when he had it, no one chased him. And so all of a sudden, he died, and they buried him, and that was it. Until one day, they were digging, and they realized what it was, and the guy died, and they threw him inside this, this hole, and it just so happens to be the hole that, you know, the bones of Elijah was there, and the guy came back alive. So sometimes the glory of God is buried, or we lose the things of God, and we don't go after it. And I don't know why. Probably because of Satan. He hardens our heart. We get used to not needing it. We we don't really, it's kind of like you lose your heart for your wife. How in the world do you do that? Well, it's easy because you get bitter or you begin to get tired of fighting or you get tired of this and all of a sudden, you know, she gets older, you get older and things change and, and yet you want someone real nice and pretty and yet you haven't looked in the mirror and looked at yourself lately. You know, it's an amazing thing, you know. You know, I want someone nice and young. Well, you're 65 years old, bald and fat. What about you? So we just don't, we don't think that way. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, if you don't chase the glory, if you don't go after it, then who? If you don't want it and your family doesn't want it, then who? And if you're a single and you don't get the message and you don't get it that, you know, it's all the young kids that were inspired by God. And it was, you remember Mary, she was 14 or 15, we believe 14, when she became pregnant with Jesus. And it was Ezekiel and, and all these guys, they were young teenagers. Everyone were teenagers. And all of a sudden, here we are, and, and the teenagers, ah, well, you know, I just want to wear my hat a certain way and put my, you know, thing over my head, you know, and the other day, some guy in the church, you know, had his, um, what's it called? Yeah, hood on. And so my wife walked up. <laughs> she never says anything. And she just tapped the guy on the shoulder and says, uh, could you remove that for a second? I want to see something. And so he pulls it back, and she, and she goes, you know, I thought so. You really are quite handsome. Goes, Why would you cover that head up? I mean, it was just like brilliant. But, you know, we don't want hoods here. You know, we don't want guys acting like they're bad, you know, and hoods and everything else, you know, because it's a church. My goodness, we can go out in the world and get that. We're different. So if you don't chase the things of God, if you don't covet the things that are pleasing to God, if you don't fight for your marriage, and who is? And so that's what you have to come to grips with is that the things that are important in life you have to go after. And boy, I tell you, now Easter with the spiritual attack, boy, we need all the prayer we can get. And so we're going to encourage you to fast and pray because Satan doesn't want victory. And so he wants us in the grave or at the tomb or on the cross. He does not want us through the tomb and walking in the newness of life. And that's where God wants us. He wants us in the past, and God wants us going for the future. God has great things for you. And so here it says in Zechariah 3, 1 through 5, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to, uh, by his side. And the Lord said to Satan, 
the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Now, this is a great moment. God is rebuking Satan. Even the Lord has chosen Jerusalem and rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And so as it's fallen apart, dying, Jerusalem is going crazy, everything is burnt up, even Joshua here is being attacked, he is still something to be bought for. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. So kind of a neat thing. Here's a man named Joshua. We believe that he was the high priest during that time. Not Joshua, the one who took him into the wilderness. But really, it was Jerubbabel and Joshua that took him in. And it was Jerubbabel and Joshua and Ezra. Ezra was the priest, or I should say the scribe, that built the temple. And so in verse 5, it says, And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So kind of a crown. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him in garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. That is probably one of the most incredible five verses you're going to read, probably in that much of a packing. Just, it's just full of information because what God is saying is that there came again another time like the book of Job. It says in the book of Job that one day the sons of God came together and Satan showed up. You remember the story? And all of a sudden, they begin to talk about this guy named Job. And God begins to brag. And he says, have you noticed my servant Job? Now, I wish God wouldn't say that to Ron Satan personally. Have you seen my servant Stephen? Well, yeah. But God, you've blessed him with everything. You've given him a staff. You've given him Calvary Chapel. You've given him health. Take his health away, he'll curse you. <laughs> so, you know, okay, go for it. Well, I don't like that. So the hedge went up. And all of a sudden, you know, whatever happens, happens. So... Finally, in Job's life, the first day, all his kids were killed. And then, you remember, he was the most wealthiest man of the world at that time. He lost all of his wealth. Finally, his wife came and said, curse God and die. That's a good wife. Just curse God and die. Get your life. It's just terrible. And then, you remember what happened. He, Satan came back and once again, you know, hey, bone for bone, flesh for flesh, you know, you know, let me touch him. Let me touch his physical body, and then he'll curse him. God said, go for it. Just don't take his life. I don't like that either, because all of a sudden, Satan now breaks him out with thousands of boils. So bad, he took a broken pot and began to scrape himself. I mean, the scene is absolutely horrendous. The bleeding, everything else. He lost everything, and all of a sudden, three friends come. Bill, Dad, Zophar, and they begin to try to help him. <laughs> they just mess things up. So for 48 chapters, 42 chapters, it's this whole thing. And two times I've taught the book of Job, I've taught it wrong. Third time I think I taught it right. Because you remember, it opens up in the throne room of God. There came a day when Satan came with the sons of man, or God, to heaven. So it opens in heaven. So the whole premise of the book is that God's, your life is in heaven. And so no matter what happens in you, God has allowed it. And it's not about suffering. It's about the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God and the grace of God and to really show you, Job, what you're made of and to show you that you by, with God and his strength can destroy Satan by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so sure enough, God gave him back everything double. So that happened. Now we're back here. That another day happens that this guy Joshua is just Joshua. And now he takes a place as all the Joshuas of the world. And now God begins to single him out, and Satan's right there. And this incredible scene happens. He's filthy. Things aren't right. And Satan is going to go after him. But before Satan can go after him, God rebukes Satan and throws him out. And then God turns around and blesses this man, and he says, listen, I'm going to call you. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to forgive you. 
and I'm going to, you know, clothe you, and I'm going to crown you because I love you, period. And that's the whole story tonight. And sometimes we say, well, God, you don't love me. Give me a break. You won't believe this story. It's an unbelievable story. So Joshua, let's get into it. Joshua the accused, and here he was. He was silent, and verse uh, 1, it tells us in uh, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Very interesting. So there you have it. You're going to be resisted by Satan. No matter what goes on in your life, you're going to be attacked. Notice in Zechariah 2.13, very interesting verse. Go back one chapter. In Zechariah 2.13, be silent of all flesh before the Lord, for he is risen up out of his holy habitation. So the thing that you have to understand is that you are now in a courtroom. If you don't see that, you're not going to get the story. It's a huge courtroom. It's God's courtroom. It's a very majestic courtroom. And no one talks in that courtroom. Like down here, everyone's chattering, everyone's talking, not in heaven. No one talks because no one has anything to say. Verdicts are made. God has made the decision. The prosecutor, the, the defense attorney is God himself. He chooses, he condemns, whatever he wants to do. And so it talks about this. He says, be silent. So that's the key word. It's silence. When you finally get to heaven, there's going to be silence. It's going to be one of those moments in your life that you're going to look over and see 24 elders throwing their crowns down before God. And they're going to fall down and say, glory, glory, glory. Then they're going to stand up and say, holy, holy, holy. And what they do for their whole life is fall down and get up. Fall down and get up. Fall down and get up. You think, man, praise God, I'm not going to heaven to do that. Well, would you like to go to hell? No. Well, then that's a great thing up in heaven. Because what you don't understand is that every time they go down and every time they come up, they see God in a brand new way. Every time they repent and come back up, they see God in his majesticness and his power, his anointing. Every time they go down and come up, they see God doing something so powerful that it just brings them in. And remember, they have glorified bodies, and God has done a work. And the 24 elders, and finally everybody throws their crown towards God. And they say, we're not worthy to wear these things because, God, you have done it all. And there's a new song in heaven of the redemption of what God has done. And all of a sudden, people say, are you going to go to heaven and play harps? I would love to go to heaven and eat bagels and play harps. You're going to hell and burn for the rest of your life with a gnashing of teeth and no one around, and it's going to be absolutely painful. And for the rest of the day, someone says, well, what do you mean the rest of the days? Well, if you could take a snail and you could put them on the size of an earth and you could make the earth a, a, you know, a ball bearing, stainless steel ball bearing, and put that snail on that, by the time he wears that down to the size of a BB, that's the first day of eternity. I mean, we're talking a long time. One day is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. But the fact is, is that you're going to be in heaven. And that is the most incredible thing that you are now thinking about throwing away. Well, because I want to live in fornication. Why? For four minutes of pleasure, and you want to give up all that with God and live with the devil? Listen to what you're talking about. Or you want to smoke that joint, and you want to go out and have a good time, and you want to rebel against your parents. Think about it. Think what you're doing. You talk to me, I'll tell you, you get shot. Or you come down with some disease or something happens in your life or you you make some foolish decision, you kill somebody in a car and now you're set in jail for the rest of your life. Or how about this, you're just hanging out with the wrong people and they kill somebody and now you go to prison for the rest of your life. Why? It's not fair. It is fair. You should not be hanging out with those people. Why are you doing that? Because you've backslidden. And that's the whole thing he's talking about here is the goodness of God and the power of God and how could you lose it? And what happens is we lose it and then we go home and we don't live it with our kids and so we lose our kids because they don't see it. And that's what's happening today is our kids are exactly who we are. And the joy is not there and the happiness is not there and we're so tuned in to how horrible things are in this world. We're not going to make it. Well, the Bible says you're going to make it. And the Bible says he'll bring you into the light. 
And if he has to separate light and darkness, he'll do that. But he will feed you. He's never saw the righteous go without. And yet, we don't trust him. We don't trust him with the future, and we don't trust him with the present. And all we want to do is get even. What is that? Of all that God has done, why can't you let it go? Why can't you be happy and just joyful and excited about what God's doing in your life? And why can you not see that giving a little bit of yourself is exactly what God wants you to do? Well, I just can't do it. I can't give no more. Yes, you can. You're only living in about two cylinders. You've got six more to go. You could pour your life into it, and I can prove it. Well, how can you do that? We're going to go fishing. You want to make it tomorrow, 5 o'clock right here? I'll be there. Well, wait a second. When's the last time you've been up at 5 o'clock? The last time I went fishing. Say, you know, oh, it's, we're going to go shopping. I'll be here at 3 o'clock, no problem. You see, the things of the flesh, I can do. The things that satisfy me, I can do. But to give money, I, I, it doesn't make sense. To speak in tongues, doesn't make sense. To be a blessing to somebody when I got my own problems, doesn't make sense. Here's what makes sense. Stay home, feel sorry for myself, and pity myself. Oh, really? Well, you know what that means. That's a suicide. You have to get rid of the mirror and put a window there and start looking at the world because you look through the invisible and you see God. Moses said he saw God, and then he made his decision. And so he says here in a very profound way in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he's done, whether it be good or bad. Do you understand what he's saying? Maybe you've never heard of this. This is that of Bema Seat. Now, as a Christian, you're not going to be judged. Amen? You've been judged at the cross. No, true. But you will be judged here for stewardship. You're not going to lose your salvation, but you could have so much more. And what this means is the way you've handled your life or the way you've treated your kids or the way you've treated the church or the way you've put others before you. You will answer for that, for your language, for the way that you turn on people, talking behind people. You will stand before God with that. And so you have to understand that we are to be good stewards before God. And that's what you have to look at. You can't say, well, praise God, I got saved. Now I'm, my life's my own. No. He brought you in. He brought you out of the world that he might take you into Christ. So now that you're in Christ, what he's called you to do, I don't know. You have to find out. Because year after year, you're not doing what God wants you to do. So that's bad stewardship. So he gives you the fruit. You don't invest it. And then all of a sudden he takes it away. And that's what he said in that parable. To some he gave one, some he gave three, some he gave five. Well, the two invested it, and they brought back more. The one was so afraid, so insecure, he just buried it. Well, you know, just common sense would say stick it in the bank and get, you know, just a barely a little percentage. But just a little bit is better than nothing. But to do nothing, to have no faith whatsoever is going to be condemned. And then he'll take that gift and give it to somebody else. And so much of the gift is by faith. Much of our life is lived by faith. And so if I don't have faith, then God give me the gift of faith. But make me a good steward. Help me to be a steward of my prayer life, of the Word of God. Help me to understand this relationship is not just any other relationship. This is with the majestic God. This is my soul, my spirit. This is the stuff that makes men and women. This is the stuff that builds character, not eating candy and cooking. And you can do all that you want. You can be as big as you want. doesn't bother me. But is your spirit big? Is your heart big? Is your life big before God? Is, it, is your life, well, Steve, my life is pleasing to God. Okay, great. But does God think that? Do we think that? You see, it says of John the Baptist, God was bragging of him. Have you noticed my servant John? You know, he's not some reed blown in the wind. You know, God's bragging about him. God's bragging about Job. Now, here's the You ready? It's going to hurt. Fasten your seatbelt. Has God been bragging about you? Hey, check out so-and-so. Check out this guy. Man, check him out. He is in tip-top condition in Christianity. We have one great day, and we think that's it, man. No, that's the normal Christian walk. Normal, God wants you to have a spirit filled 24 7. 
The supernatural is what God's going for. The miraculous, that's what God's going for. I can just barely make it to church. Well, praise God. But you sure get to buy a new car quicker than you get to church. And you sure go see a movie without getting up and walking around. And you can sure go through two hours doing what I want to do, but when it comes 35 minutes... Just relax. Chill out. I'm not going to kill you. So we're all going to answer. We believe that. Okay, great. In Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men once to die and thereafter the judgment. So Joshua found himself before God. He found himself in the presence of the Almighty and with him he also found the presence of Satan. And you'll find that out. When Paul received that incredible vision, remember? He said, I don't know what happened. He said, but I was caught up in the third heaven. I think personally, it was when he was stoned at Lystra. He said, I was caught up and I saw things I couldn't talk about. And then you remember the very next thing says, and there was given to me, help me out, what? Say it loud, a thorn. There was given to me. Who gave it to him? It's okay, say it. God gave me a thorn. Why would God do that? (laughs) Because he loves you. Well, why is he going to ruin something so great with something so bad? Because he has to balance you out. He has to take that experience in heaven and all of a sudden balance it out way down here so all of a sudden you're not prideful. And so there was given to me a thorn. Paul prayed what? Three times. Did it go away? No. And what did God say to Paul? It, you know, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. It's just relax and accept it. There was a time in Moses' life he wanted to go across into Canaan. And finally God says, I'm sick and tired of talking to you about this. Do not ever bring it up again. You think that's pretty drastic? Yeah. You think that's pushing God as far as you can? Uh-huh. Have we done that? All the time. But... If God is saying no, 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 it means that God has something special. If God is saying no, 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 it means that God is not saying no to who you are, but there's something bigger and better that God wants you to do. But we don't think that way. We just throw God out. Because if I don't get what I want, and so here we are, I see this, and God sees this. And if I don't get this, I'm walking away. But God wants to give you all this. So how about this? Quit telling God what you're going to do and just let God do everything for you. I'm so worried about this one thing when God wants to take care of all this in your life, but you won't yield to him that one thing so he can't do all this in your life. And that's what he's saying. All of us are going to stand before the presence of God. And so Joshua found himself one day in the very presence of God. And kind of interesting when you look at this thing, he was silent in verse 1. But also, he was guilty in verse 1. Notice this. He goes on to say, And Joshua the high priest standing before him, and he was standing in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you believe that? Every one of us? Everyone. We all have sinned, even your wives. Yes, even your wives. Sometimes they don't believe it, but they have. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the reason why they're guilty. Every one of us are guilty. And then also we find out that this word filthy in verse 3, and Joshua is clothed with filthy garments. In other words, a very graphic thing. And, and so here they are absolutely devastated. God had just done a work. And, and so because of the filthiness of their life, the priest. Now, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 8. I think it would be good for you to kind of get this one verse under your belt. Because I want to show you something about what God was trying to do. He's now having this man stand before him as we talked about Joshua. But here's the unique thing. Joshua didn't really understand why. But God was going to show him some of the things that were going on in his life and in the priest's life. Now remember, he was a priest. And so the priests were not doing very well with God at this time. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1 and 3, this is what he says. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month. Now, Ezekiel went into Babylon with Daniel. Ezekiel was out by the river, and Daniel was inside. 
So while Daniel was inside ministering with all Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ezekiel was being picked up and taken by the Spirit back into Jerusalem by the head. It came to pass in the sixth year, verse 1, in the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house and the elders of Judah set before me that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. That's a good thing. Then I beheld in low likeness as the appearance of fire from appearance of my loins even downward, fire from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness and the color of amber. Can you imagine that? Just the power and the glory of God. He put forth his hand. Uh, he, put, he put forth that form of a hand. So he wasn't sure, but it looked like a hand. And took me by the locks of my head. Just picked me up on my hair, you know. I can just see it. Boom. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me into the vision of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looked towards the north where was set of the image of jealousy which provoked to jealousy. Now, verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thy eyes now the way towards the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way towards the north. Behold, northward as the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy is in the entry. Now, don't get you confused. What's happening? He's been lifted up. He's been taken out of Babylon back into Jerusalem. He's been taken there to see the spirit of jealousy that caused the reason why they were taken into Babylon. And the spirit of jealousy, now check it out, is the pastors. Not the congregation, the pastors and the leaders. I know no one's going to listen to me, but that's where it happens. Now, I realize we all have jealousies, right? Sometimes we want a car. Sometimes we want this or a better house. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about positions. I'm talking about power. I'm talking about anointing. I'm talking about giftings. I'm talking about getting hurt because someone's better than you. I'm talking about someone who can sell something better than you. I'm talking about something that's better than you. I'm talking about when your wife is more educated than you. You understand what I'm saying? It's that spirit that just drives you crazy. It's that spirit, and that's what God's going after. And he says here in verse 6, he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seeth thou that they do, even the great abominations the house of Israel commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary by turning thee yet again, and thou shalt see the greater abomination. Verse 7, he brought me to the door of the court. Now see, he went to the wall, now to the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in that wall. So we had to dig a little bit. See, he wasn't going to find it until he dug a little bit. When I had dug in the wall, behold, a door. He said unto me, Go in, behold, the wicked abomination they do here. Now they're inside the priest's mind. So they're now inside the minds of the priest. And verse 9, he said to me, Go in, and behold the wickedness. Verse 10. So I went in and saw, behold, every form of creeping thing, abominable beast, all of the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Would you say that's pornography? Do you know that six out of ten pastors are into pornography? Every creeping thing. Verse 12. Then said he unto me, son of man, has thou seen what the ancient of the house of Israel do in darkness, what your fathers did in darkness? They had the little groves and all those things. Every man in his chamber of his imagination, his mind, for they say the Lord seeth us not. We're in darkness. No one sees us. We can fantasize. We can imagine. We can, we can do all this stuff sexually in our minds, and it's okay. Well, hold on a second. And the Lord won't forsake us. Verse 13. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see the greater abomination that they do. You're kidding me. It's worse? Yeah. Then he brought me to a door of the gate of the Lord's house. Now, do you hear what he's saying? There was, a, there was a wall, and then there was a court, and then now we're getting close to the house of the Lord. So now the sin is getting inside the house of God. And so he says in verse 15, Then said he unto me, Thou see this, O wicked this man, son of man, turn ye yet again, thou shalt see greater abominations. He brought me into the inner court. Now it was the outer court. Now it was the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, 
at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs turned towards the temple of the Lord. In other words, they were this way. They're not even looking at God, but they're now looking towards the east. So here is just Ezekiel having a great time with the guys, you know, in Babylon. And God yanks them up and brings them over and says, I want to show you how what it, when I say the filthiness, I want to show you what it really means, the filthiness. It means that God gets into my inner man. It means that God reveals what I do in secret. It means that God knows my thought and the intent of my heart. And God knows what I would do if I had the chance to do it. See, that's the danger. It's not that I, I, I don't want to do it. It's just if I could do it and not get away with it, what would I do? It's the thought pattern. It's that imagination. It's the creativityness. And that's why pastors and worship leaders have such a hard time because they're so creative. And all of a sudden, you begin to fantasize. You begin to do all these things. And, and when all of a sudden you're rejected and the congregation kind of rejects you and they don't like your messages and your wife rejects you and your kids reject you, what do you do as a guy? There's not very many things you can do. You can turn to God, but we don't do that. So we turn to alcohol or we turn to sex, or we turn to some pornography thing. That's what happens every single time. Women know how to deal with rejection, but men don't. And so he's saying the priests are no longer, and this is why I took them all the way over here. So don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing, and don't tell me I don't have a right to do it. I'm telling you these men were hypocrites. And all of a sudden, God is just going after it. And so when you look at Joshua, is there any hope for him? Oh, absolutely. Because he is standing before God. It's just that God wanted him to know that God knew. Isn't that cool? It's not that he wanted to hurt Joshua or condemn Joshua. It's like, let's reason together, saith the Lord. You could be a great mom, but you have to quit beating your kid. You have to learn how to give in a little bit. You have to not let that cry get underneath your skin. You have to learn how to talk to somebody about it. You have to learn to humble yourself. You just can't do everything yourself. You could be a great business guy, but you won't humble yourself and ask for help. But God has anointed you. And this pride is all over the place. And, and so he says, and then finally we realize, number two, not only that's Joshua's there. He is there, filthiness and everything else. He's standing. Jesus and Satan, what's he going to do? I mean, and what's going on in his own life? And that's where we are. We have this incredible God on this side, and we got this incredible wicked Satan on this side, and then who are we? <laughs> I look over here, Jesus. Hi, Jesus. I just love you so much. I look over here, hey, how are you doing, Satan? Man, I need a couple things right now. See, we go back and forth, and hey, can you give me a little bit of money? You know, maybe I'll see that girl after work tonight. You know, my wife's gone, and Oh, I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, you praise God. And why do people like Jimmy Swagger and those guys fall? What, what happens? Well, the higher you go spiritually, the more the fall is and the more corrupt it is and the more perverse it is because you're dealing in the realm of the Spirit. And when all of a sudden you have it spiritually and you have the charisma and you have everything going for you, and all of a sudden, you fall, you fall into perversion like you've never seen before. And that's why you, as you look at television, you can't, no, wait, how did that happen? It's really easy. Because the higher you go this way, in the realm of holiness, when you fall, you fall into perversion right across the way. So that means you better take heed. Because God is going to show you, and God is going to reveal, and God is going to bring things into your life to protect you. And there are people that love you, so you don't have to do this thing by yourself because you can't do it. I can't tie my shoes. I need someone to tie my shoes. So that's that whole humility that God does. And then it says here, number two, we're going to get very far tonight. I can see right now. <laughs> Satan, secondly, Satan, the prosecutor. And notice what he was doing. He was attacking. In Zechariah uh, chapter 3, verse 1 he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And who is it? Tell me. Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Is he a good friend? <laughs> Why do you like him so much? Stephen, 
that offends me. Who do you talk about the most? Do you talk about trials or do you talk about the Lord? If you talk about just trials, then you talk about Satan way too much. You see, I'm convinced that we just, we, we give Satan way too much credibility in our life. Oh, I'm so bummed. Well, how long have you been bummed? About two years. I'm so, I, and you, brought, you bring everybody down with you. I'm, I'm just overwhelmed, Pastor. Just overwhelmed. How many pastors, I've been through every one of your pastors here at church. How many churches have you gone to? I've been to 27 churches. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I don't even want to go there. But it's, it's, it's like, um, let me ask you the question. You're standing in between. Who are you going to turn to? Tell me. Jesus. Are you sure? Well, I don't know now. Right. It would be such a privilege to see a congregation say, Jesus is it. And that's what happens when revival, revival hits. When revival comes, teenagers are on fire for God, and they don't even think about Satan. And moms and dads are on fire, and they don't think about fleshly things. And they don't worry about buying a car. They can't wait to get to church. And they don't worry about making more money. They just want to get to church because the Lord's coming. But when all of a sudden I lose Jesus, that I need what everyone else has. And I deserve it, and I'm going to get it, and I don't care how I get it. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to work for it. I'll work seven jobs, and then my wife, I lose my wife. What happened? Well, Satan's right there resisting you. You don't want to turn to Jesus. You're kidding me. He's let you down. Jesus, this Jesus, he won't give you nothing. In fact, he takes everything away from you. Didn't he take your child away? Didn't he take your job away? Didn't he take your esteem away? Look at the way he made you. Look at all the problems in your life. Look at everybody else. If I, if I, look at Rob. Perfect Rob. You know, I can't wait to get to heaven. He'll be in a wheelchair and I'll be brand new. You know, but you, you know, it's just like, God, why? Why me? This is not fair. And all of a sudden, you come to grips with it is fair. And thank God that Rob is healthy. Thank God that there's nothing wrong, really. Really. I really sincerely mean that. Now I'm after Pat because he eats my pie. But otherwise, you know. But be besides that, if that's the only thing wrong, they can eat all the pie they want behind my back. I don't care. I just love the guys. I love them. Don't you love Pat? Yeah. Don't you love Rob? Yeah. Don't you love Steve? Well, we're not sure yet. Okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but here we have it, you know, and, and so you have a choice. And so it says here in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking to whom may devour. So he's looking at Kevin. He's watching Kevin. He won't take his eyes off Kevin. He sees everything Kevin does. He's checking Kevin out right now. He's, Kevin's at the gym. See, he's, what girl is he looking at? Is he looking at any girl right now? Oh, he's looking. He's at church. Is he in the Bible? Does he have his Bible open? You know? Is Kelly, Kelly falling asleep over there? What's she doing? She's, her, is her mind on my study or is it on what? That's home, what she has to do tonight when she gets home. See, Satan doesn't give up. 21 years you've been faithful. 21 years you've been absolutely faithful to God. And then one day you're at a hotel and a girl knocks on your door by accident, and you stumble. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if he ruins you. He doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. He doesn't care how faithful you are to God. He'll wait for 30, 40, 50 years for that one moment. He'll pull the trigger. And that's why God has to test you. That's why God has to make you strong. That's why you have to go through trials. That's why God has to convince you that you're not as strong as you really are. That's why when all of a sudden I'm boasting that I'm so together, so this and so that, something happens in my life and I fall apart. And the day of the adversary, that's when you test it. And though I cry out to God, why do you do this? I hear this voice every single time. I put you in the wilderness these 40 years to prove you, to try you, to see what's in your heart. I, just, I know what's in your heart, Stephen. I made you. But I don't think you see what's in your heart. And so Peter didn't believe Jesus. And sometimes I don't. And then I realized in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 
I just say this, very simple. Why does broccoli so ugly and banana, spritz, b- banana splits look so good? You know, I mean, ice cream and chocolate. And I had a root beer the other day that was so good. I was thinking about root beer float, man, with a little whipped cream on top and a little cherry and this dripping with chocolate and a little boysenberry. And, or a piece of broccoli. And why don't we lust after people like four or five hundred pounds? Why don't we do that? You know? No, my, my, I lust after certain things, and Satan knows it. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest that the light of the glorious gospel, who the image of God should shine unto them, Boy, he has blinded their eyes. And so what should we be praying? God, unblind my eyes. So what should I pray all the time? God, open my eyes. You remember what the Bible says? That we have the circumcision. They can't go into the covenant land till they were circumcised. Well, what about this? I need my ears circumcised. What's that mean? There's dead skin over my ears. I cannot hear the word of God. I need to rip it off, and it's painful. Or once again, my heart has been hardened and so there's that dead skin and I need to rip it off so I can feel once again what it is to love and trust. And boy, it's so hard when you've been so hurt so much to love and trust again. And so he's also noticed here, he's the accuser. Right here in Revelation 12, 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength. And the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Do you believe that? I'm just curious. Do you believe that every day Satan is coming before God talking about you? Every day, day and night. Hey, Steve Mays is no good. Hey, Kevin's no good. Hey, Rob's no good. Hey, they hate you. They don't love you. And here's what God does. All of a sudden, God does all these things, and then Satan says, well, you're not trusting him, yeah? And you're not doing this, yeah? And you're not doing that, yeah? Therefore, you don't love God. Well, I guess they don't. And that's why backsliders don't come to God. How can you come back to God after you've done everything like that? You can come back to God anytime you want because we know our God. And then he says here in a very profound way in 2 Corinthians 2.11, at least Satan should get the advantage of us we are not ignorant of his devices. Do you know that he lays in wait? Do you know that he does things? Do you know he sets you up? Let me give you an example. Moses, 80 years before, had a problem with anger. You remember? He killed that Egyptian. At the very end of his ministry, 80 years into it, what took him out of the ministry? His anger. Sometimes there's only one thing that stays with you your whole life. You have to battle that thing hassle that thing, but you know what it is. You know what mocks you and keeps you walking around Jericho. And why did they have to walk around Jericho for so long? Because they were convinced they could take it. And I believe that with all my heart. I believe with all my heart when they came out of the wilderness, they were ready to take it. We have a strategy. We're ready to hit this thing. We've had it. And God says, no, 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 stop. What? Stop now? We got the momentum going. I know the momentum of the flesh. Go get circumcised. What? That's kind of painful, God. Get up in the mountains. Go grab a stone and get circumcised. Because you're not going in until you cut your flesh. And then you come down here and we're going to have dinner in the presence of our enemy. Right under their nose, we're going to read our Bible. Well, see, we don't understand what that means. That means that when you're really mad at your husband, you still get in God's Word and fix him a great dinner. That means you are able not to lose it. That means that you're able in the presence of the enemy to keep peace in the home and stay tight with God. That's a great feat, let me tell you right there. Because what happens? Satan gets you so mad, you close your Bible. And then you don't read it. So two things happen. One, you're not right with God. And two, you're not hearing from God. So Satan gets you both ways. And we're not wise enough to see that. And then finally, the judge. 
comes along <laughs> in verse 1. He says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And listen here very powerfully. He says, Christ is willing. Verse 2, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, does this make more sense now? The Lord rebuke you. <laughs> this is my courtroom. What are you doing here? Get out of here. <laughs> I like that. Get out of here. And the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this the brand plucked out of the fire? This is Joshua. This is a priest. This is a man that's gone astray, but I have pulled him out. So get your hands off him. Get away from him. You don't have a right to stand next to my servant. Do you hear what I'm saying? Every place he puts his foot down, I've given to him for an inheritance. My thoughts for him are good, not evil to an expected end. I have great things for him. Get away from him now. And Satan, God doesn't mess around with Satan, nor does he make fun. Sometimes we say, oh, you stupid idiot. No, I wouldn't do that because now you're at his arena. Michael said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And he took the body of Moses. Here God is saying the very same thing. He rebuked Satan. He respected the authority that Satan had. But you have no life, no presence next to my servant. Get away. Now, for the first time, I'm beginning to realize how special I really am, that God will fight for me. And what's the biggest beef we have? No one cares. No one hears. No one wants to fight for me. That's not true. God hears a woman. God is willing to fight for a woman. And God is willing to listen to a woman. And the same with a man. So don't do that. He says here also in Zechariah 2.13, be silent. And what about this in Revelation 17, verse 14? These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they are with him, are called and chosen and faithful. And so we could go on and do some other things, but really tonight, as we've kind of run out of time, we'll pick it up next week. But let me just give you a couple things here. In Romans 5.8, but God commanded his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And let me give you four things. I, I, it'll only take a second. This is, remember these four things. Number one, God chose you because you were there. But secondly, you're going to find out that God has cleansed you. And then you're going to find out that God has clothed you. And then you're going to find out that God has crowned you. All that is coming up. Next week, we just got to wait. Sorry. 